most common objections to Christianity. These are, over the next four weeks, seven of the most common questions that people say is a barrier to where they can honestly deal with God and issues surrounding faith. And I realize that these may not be issues for you, but you have to be prepared um, to respond to these questions if the opportunity presents itself. It's not just, you know, the preacher or pastor's job. If, if you claim to have faith in Jesus, then he has laid the responsibility on every single one of us. Uh, and you might ask, well, why should I bother at all? Um, let's, let's look at that first verse in your outline there, if you want to turn to the sermon insert from 1 Peter 3.15. Can we read that together? This is really important a verse in the life of, of a church or in the individual Christian. Can we read this together? You must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it, but do this in a gentle and respectful way. Now that verse gives us you know, three direct commands. First, it, we make it personal. It's, it's personal. You, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life, right? You can't impart that which you don't possess. And so our, our standing duty as believers is to always be ready and willing to explain why we believe what we believe. And Peter said that this is so important that it's an act of worship. That's the word he used. The, the word worship is to ascribe worth to something. And the imagery is very powerful. It says the value you ascribe worth to something is Jesus Christ. And it's illustrated in your willingness and ability to explain what you believe. So it's, it's got to be personal. Second, it has to be practical. Practical, always be ready to explain it and always means all the time, right? And so explain in the Greek is the word apologia. It, it's meant that we should think it through carefully and defend it practically. And so here, here's where we come up short. We don't think it through, and so we just have to make sure that it's practical, that it makes sense to someone who might not understand. Uh, do you remember the, the KISS method? Do you know what I'm talking about? Keep it simple. No, we don't use that word here, saint, right? <laughs> Keep it simple, saint. Uh, the, the idea here is that it's got to be practical, that it has to make sense. So if someone asks you about your faith, can you explain it? I mean, do you have the same confidence uh, that the kindergartner had? The teacher asked him, what are you drawing? And he said, I'm drawing a picture of God. And the teacher said, but nobody knows what God looks like. And the boy said, well, they will when I'm finished with this picture. Right. And so you have to have that kind of confidence. See, it's got to be practical and personal. And then the attitude in which it is said is so important. Third, you've got to make it palatable. We tried to keep the, the preacher thing going here with the P, so not my favorite word. If you don't know how to spell it, I don't either. So palatable. It says, do this in a gentle and respectful way. That's not what we often see from Christians in culture, is it? That attitude is everything. That how you say what you say is as important as what you say. And far too often, our attitude as Christians is defensive or argumentative or even belligerent, especially if you are on social media. It's really reprehensible sometimes, and I kind of cringe when I see Christians engage sometimes. Uh, the scriptures are clear that whenever we have the opportunity to explain uh, why we believe what we believe, that we should do it with gentleness and respect. Gentle is just a word that means Patience with a purpose, that you listen to them patiently and respectfully, right? The Greek word there really is phobos. That's where we get the word fear. It means to be fearful or to be alarmed. And you might think, well, what are we supposed to be afraid of? But here's what Peter meant. When somebody asks you to tell them why you believe what you believe, it ought to strike a little bit of fear in our hearts that we are now the visible representation of the invisible God that you've been given this opportunity to communicate with another human being what God is like in his plan for humanity. And that ought to make us think like, you know, I should do this carefully, well thought out and with gentleness and respect. Can you do that? And if, and if you can't, 
let's learn to do it together. Now, when we finish the next four weeks, you're gonna have some basic answers to seven of the most common objections. There's an eighth objection I would list, but we're not gonna cover that for a specific reason to come later on. But today we're gonna look at two of them. And the first one, what about all the people who've never heard about Jesus? Have you ever wondered that question? Well, what about all the people who've never heard of Jesus? Have you ever been asked that question? You have to be able to answer it. And sometimes, sometimes objections to faith are just smoke screens that people throw because they don't want to deal with Jesus. And so they've heard these from other people and maybe they haven't thought it through, but it's an honest question. It's a fair question to ask. And, and maybe some of you have been asking this question yourselves. And the answer is simply this, God will be fair. God will be fair, no, no matter what, God will be fair. Look at Genesis 18, 25, just a couple of verses on how, how God is fair, you know? Should not the judge of all the earth do what is right? Absolutely, he will. Deuteronomy 32, 4, he is the rock, his work is perfect. Everything he does is just and fair. He is a faithful God who does no wrong. How just and upright he is. So God will never condemn anyone for rejecting a Jesus they never heard of. That, that wouldn't be fair. And so the bottom line is this, when all the facts are in and we finally have uh, the big picture, no one will be able to accuse God of being unfair. He'll be fair. And the second thing you have to know if you're asking this question is that God is within reach of everyone. That God's within reach of everyone, no matter where they live. In fact, Acts 17, 26, from one man, he created all the nations throughout the whole earth he decided beforehand which should rise and fall, and he determined their boundaries. So understand that, that God is the one keeping the global map doing what it's doing. Verse 27, his purpose in all of this was that the nations should seek after God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him, though he is not far from any one of, the, of us. So you have to understand this, that wherever you're born, God is within reach. Whatever family you are in, God is within reach. And regardless of the religious background that you came up in, whether it was Muslim or Hindu or Jewish or, or whatever, God will always create circumstances to point the way to the true God. Sometimes through creation, sometimes through adversity, sometimes through good times. God's deepest desire is to connect with you. And he never plays hide and seek. He is always reachable. In, in the first century, some people were complaining to the apostle Peter about the fact that Jesus said he, he was going to come back to earth, but he hadn't returned yet. And, and, you know, it's been 25 years. Come on, like, what's the problem here? And so Peter wrote them, and this is what he said. Don't overlook the obvious here. God is not late. He is restraining himself on account of you, holding back on the end because he doesn't want anyone lost. See, so he's giving, one, giving everyone space and time to change, that everyone, not just the people of this country or that country or, or this religious background or that religious background, he is fair and within reach of everyone. You see, most people, their, their problem is not discovering God, it's deciding to discover God. The bulk of humanity you know, is just kind of doing their thing, and so God will be fair and the second thing is that God is within reach of everyone. And third, God will be found by sincere seekers. God will be found by sincere seekers. Jeremiah 29, 13, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Now, do you see any geographic limitation to that? Do you, do you see any religious background that limits that verse? God has said, seek me and you will find me. Jesus said the same thing in Matthew 7. Keep on asking and you'll be given what you ask. Keep on looking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open for everyone who asks, receives. Everyone who seeks, finds, and the door is open to everyone who knocks. See, there, there's no limits to who can know God. 
Whoever is seriously seeking God will find him. In fact, in Revelation 5, 9, it describes the people who are in heaven, who are from every tribe, language, people group, nation. There will be people from the deepest recesses of Aboriginal New Guinea to communist China to Iceland to, of all places, Kentucky. Because you see, God is greater than our own understanding. He says, you seek and I guarantee you'll find. And I've been so fortunate in my life to have met so many people from various backgrounds who found God. I've met Christ followers from, from every continent, well, except Antarctica. I've been so privileged to, to meet people who met God even though their background is so different from mine, that they all found God somehow because God is so much bigger than our circumstances. So if you're one of those people here this morning who wonder about like, you know, what happens to those people who, who never hear about Jesus, you don't sweat it because God will be fair. He is within reach of everyone and he'll be found. Those are the three words to remember. Fair, reach, found. Fair, reach, found. Then if someone asks you that question, you can quickly walk through what I just walked through. You don't have to even remember the verses, just remember that God will be fair. God is within reach, that God promised that he'd be found. And we, we don't believe God would lie. And whenever I've talked to someone about this, I, I like to bring them back to the bottom line issue, which is simply this. The day that you stand before God, the subject will not be, what about all the people who never heard? The subject will be, what did you do with what you knew? And you know. I mean, if you're here this morning, you know the claims of Jesus. You know there is a God who really cares and loves for you. You, you know what you need to personally connect with your creator. And so the first question that people often ask, what about all the people who have never heard? You have the answer. What is it again? Thank you for... Those of you who said it, fair reach found. And the second question is closely related to this one. How could Jesus be the only way to God? That's kind of a narrow proposition, isn't it? And I'll admit that it is. But before we like, jump straight into that question, it might be time for a quick mental break. Um, after um, our second service this morning, we're going to be hosting a, a bridal shower for Shelby Smith. Shelby is raised in this church, um, but I just ha have one word of advice for her uh, that comes from an event in New Zealand where a cake maker really blew it. Um, a couple there was getting married and they ordered a cake requesting a verse from 1 John on it. It was 1 John 4.18. The cake was to say, there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. It's a great verse. But the bakery must have misread the order form because when the cake arrived on the day of the wedding, the newlyweds were aghast to find that 1 John 4.18 was not on the cake, but instead it was simply John 4.18, which is a completely different verse. And so imagine unveiling the cake at your wedding to read this inscription. The fact is you have had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. I'd be smashing that cake in someone's face, but... Okay, back to our regularly scheduled programming. Most people look at getting to God as kind of a roadmap, right? You know, you... I mean, even if you use Google Maps or whatever, you understand that it's a map, right? And they believe that if you want to go from, like, Lexington to, let's say, St. Louis, there are many ways to get there, right? As long as you have a map, you can take all kinds of different routes. In fact, you can drive a car, you could ride on a bike, you could fly in a plane, you could take... A train. There are lots of ways to get there, and as long as your goal is St. Louis and you have a map, then you're going to make it. But, and, and some will get there quicker, perhaps, than others, but everyone will make it, and people believe that's you know, the way religion is, that, that all of the various faiths will end up in the same place as long as you're sincere. But we have to understand that as long as you're asking this question, how could Jesus be the only way to God, the way to God is not a matter of sincerity, is it? It's not a matter of sincerity. 
because it's possible to be sincerely wrong. I mean, we all have been sincerely wrong, haven't we? I mean, have you ever met someone who was sincerely wrong? And the truth is that a sincere religious person has no advantage over a non-religious person if he's worshiping or she's worshiping the wrong God. So example, you know, if I were to consider this, this microphone to be God and I really believe that it could take me into this profound relationship with God for all of eternity and I bow down to it every day and even give it sacrifices, is it capable of taking me to God? No, right? Can we, can we agree on that, that this microphone is not God? And if you just track the logic here, that it's possible to be sincerely wrong. I mean, I don't know if you've ever met someone from the Flat Earth Society. There are about 200 members. Um, some of them join just because it's fun to say they're a member, but there are people, I, I've met them at the University of Michigan, why I don't like that institution. Anyway, sorry if you're from the University of Michigan, I'm a Michigan State fan. Anyway, but their beliefs, a Flat Earth Society person, uh, their beliefs aren't going to change the fact that the Earth isn't flat, right? Even for them. I mean, if it only took sincerity, then if I were to walk around with my friend who was in the Flat Earth Society, if I were to like start walking and just keep walking, and I don't believe the Earth is flat, and they do believe the earth is flat, would there be a place where they fall off the face of the earth, but I keep going? No, right? It's absurd. If someone with a gun sincerely believes that it's not loaded, will that change the outcome when they pull the trigger of a loaded gun? See, it's not a matter of sincerity. I mean, if you, if you paint wings on a pig and call it a bird and you toss it off a cliff, will it fly? Well, for a couple seconds, right? And then it's just called bacon. But <laughs> see, the issue is truth, not sincerity. Truth operates separately from our feelings and our desires. And the thrust of the Bible is never on blind faith or sincerity. It's on the object of your faith. And so you have to understand that the way to God isn't a matter of sincerity, and it's also not a matter of opinion. It's not a matter of opinion. See, truth is never just personal opinion because opinions can't create truth. And so we might argue about, you know, what exactly is this color blue? It would be opinion, but we could all agree maybe it's a shade of blue of some kind. But it doesn't really change the color of the carpet regardless of our opinions, especially for those who are are colorblind, they may have no idea what the color is. Personal opinion will never create truth any more than sincerity will create truth. And so if we put this in the context of faith, if you think about it, everybody can't be right when their beliefs conflict over the same issue. So for example, Christians believe that there is one God who exists in three persons and our Muslim and Jewish friends disagree, and they believe that God is indivisibly one. Um, Hindus believe that God is everything, that I'm God, you're God, my dog is God. Islam claims that, that Jesus was not the son of God, and that he didn't die for the sins of humanity, and it wasn't necessary. And then Buddha, on the other hand, was noncommittal on the existence of God, and so he was kind of an agnostic. And so, so listen closely, we may all be wrong, right? But we all can't be right. And that's important to understand. And while there is something beautiful about every religion in the world, we can't all be right about the same issues. You see, the way to God is never a matter of sincerity or opinion. And like it or not, the way to God is exactly what Jesus claimed it to be. And that's important to understand because Jesus said a lot of outrageous things, didn't he? He said, you've got to lose your life to gain it. And we've talked about a few of those statements the last three weeks. He said, it's better to give than to receive. He said, you should love those who persecute you. You know, turn your cheek to those who slap you. 
But the most outrageous thing he said was that I am the only way to God. And whether we like it or not, he said it. And we have to deal with that. And, and I don't believe he said that out of arrogance or ignorance, but out of great passion. That he has a far better perspective on the things of the Spirit than, than we do. That he wasn't on a head trip. He, he had a heart that bled for humanity. And towards the end of his days, the disciples were meeting with him. And he said, listen, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And I'll meet you there. And Thomas answered, well, we haven't any idea where you're going. So how can we know the way? And Jesus said, well, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. And you know, other religious leaders have said, I will show you the way to God. But Jesus said, I am the way. Other religious leaders have said, I will show you the door to God. And Jesus said, I am the door. And not only did Jesus make this outrageous claim, but his disciples reaffirmed it time and time again. Peter, for example, said, salvation comes no other way. No other name has been or will be given to us by which we can be saved, only this one. And John said, and all who believe in God's Son have eternal life. Those who don't obey the Son will never experience eternal life, but the wrath of God remains upon them. So if you're someone who's wondering, how can Jesus say he's the only way? The answer is so simple. He said it and backed it up, what he said, by giving his life and rising from the dead. And so our option is, do, do we believe it or not? In fact, we have three options available to us. This isn't original to me. Option number one, Jesus was a con man. He was a con man. He was a liar. He, he wasn't the son of God, and he knew it, and he conned people, and he just wanted a bigger following. Is that plausible? And if you go out and ask people, or at least most people, was Jesus a good moral teacher, you get a near 100% response that Jesus was a good moral teacher. But that creates a problem, because how can he be a good moral teacher if he's a liar about who he was. So you either have to accept the fact that he was telling the truth or he was lying and he was never content to be called a good moral teacher. He claimed to be the son of God. Luke 22, and they all said, are you the son of God then? And he said to them, yes, I am. And then they said, what further need do we have of testimony for we have heard it ourselves from his own mouth? that even his enemies acknowledged his claim that he was the son of God. In fact, in the trial before Pilate in John 19, when they saw him, the leading priests and temple guards began shouting, crucify, crucify. And Pilate said, you know, you crucify him. I find him not guilty. And the Jewish leaders replied, by our laws, he ought to die because he called himself the son of God. See, this is the only man in history who was crucified for a claim, not a crime. And so it leaves us in a position of deciding, was, was he lying? Like, is he a con man? Or is he telling the truth? And if you're with us this morning and you're thinking, I just can't buy that he was a liar because he was a good moral teacher, then you have to go to option number two, which is he was a crazy man. I guess that's a possibility that he was just crazy. He was a looney tune. He was deranged, okay? He, he, he was a really smart guy, but maybe he got a little confused and he got carried away with his teaching. And so he just imagined that he was God. And, and you can believe that if you like, but there's a problem with that. And the problem is that he really never did or said anything that would be consistent with mental illness, in John 5, 18, so the Jewish leaders tried all the more to kill him. In addition to disobeying the Sabbath rules, he had spoken of God as his father, thereby making himself equal with God. And when someone's, you know, mentally unfit, there are always abnormalities and imbalances that go with it. And yet Jesus always acted with composure, consistency, uh, never speaking in, in rambling sentences that didn't make sense. There's nothing in his lifestyle and historical documents to indicate that he was 
mentally ill. And so if you're with us and you're wondering how can Jesus be the only way to God, option one is that he is a con man. Option two is that he was a crazy man. But if you're not willing to say that he was uh, mentally unfit, then you only have one option left, and that was that he was the Christ man. That there are no other options. That if you study his life and study what he said and ask yourself, which is the most probable I think an honest evaluation of who he was and what he did will land you at the third option, that he was the Christ man. And you know what? Sooner or later, everyone's going to agree. Philippians 2 says that in the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess Jesus is Lord. Everyone is going to come to the same conclusion sooner or later, and sooner is better than later. And so are you willing to bet your eternal destiny that Jesus was either a liar or a lunatic. And if you remember Apollo 13, you know, the the spacecraft headed to the moon, explosion of an oxygen tank knocked out the guidance system. You know, the whole world held their breath as three astronauts were rocketing into space and, and no way to control that spacecraft. And NASA went to work to come up with a solution. And after a number of hours, they radioed the spacecraft and said that there's one way. You've got one chance at getting home. You have to patch into the guidance system of the lunar landing module, and we think we can bring you home. Now, do you think those astronauts argued about that? Do you think for a moment they said, well, come on, there has to be 50 ways to get home. NASA had a better perspective, and NASA said one way. So men and women, God has a better perspective than we do, and he says one way. And we can argue and ignore his advice, but how foolish is that? So I just want to encourage you, if you haven't connected with God because you've wondered how about people who've never heard, or how could Jesus be the only way? Today would be a great day to come to a logical, objective decision that Jesus was indeed who he said he was, and then begin to relate to him as a person-to-person relationship. So with that in, in mind, let's bow and pray this morning. We thank you, Lord, for loving us so much that you sent us your Son, You could have set up so many religious hoops for us to jump through to reach you, but instead you reached to us. Lord, when the opportunity presents itself, help us to remember these basic concepts and to be ready and able to share at any time whenever we're asked. Lord, if there's anyone here who's never really engaged you, may they begin that now, or at the very least, may they seek help in doing so by coming and talking with me or another follower of Jesus who can guide them. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.